All right. Last Sunday, we dived into Book of Exodus, and, you know, Book of Exodus is super exciting and fun, at least for me, and I hope you too. And today, we are going to dive into Chapter 3, which is probably one of the most infamous verses out there. Uh, we have to skip Chapter 2 because... We just don't have enough time, and I'm sad about that because there's so much good materials there. And even today's material, there's so much. Like, I wanted to do John Piper style with seven points and nine applications, but that would take two hours at least, and it's Mother's Day, so uh, I'm going to give you just two points. But anyways, Exodus chapter 3, we're going to look at verse 1 through 12. We don't have it on the screen, so hopefully you have it on your paper. Uh, so 1 through 12, and when you have found, let's stand in the reverence of the Word of God, and I'll read first, and we'll alternate back and forth until verse 12. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight why the bush is not burned. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is the holy ground. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the with which the Egyptians oppressed them. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children out of Egypt, Israel out of Egypt? Amen. You may sit. Dear Heavenly Lord, may the word reveal to us of your heart. Let us learn more about you, of your character, of your wonder, of your majesty. Lord, leave us in awe of who you are and let us stop wondering about who we are, how small we are. But let us tap into that identity in you. Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so as I told you, we're gonna, I'm going to try to make it more con- con- condensed. But so good. Like so, much, so many good materials that like, I, I hate to just leave it out there. But what can we do? What can we do? So two points today. First, God calls the unqualified. God calls the unqualified. And second point for today is God prepares you for the call. You know, sometimes we think the call is something for just few people, even as a Christian. But I'm going to try to let you know that the call is actually for every one of us if you believe that you are Christ's follower. So let's get to it. God calls those who are not qualified. First point today is that God calls those who are not qualified. And when I say call, when I say that, I mean um, using the word called as by God, as God giving certain task or purpose to a person to fulfill. And we can certainly know that Moses, yes, definitely seems, that seems to be the case. Exodus chapter 3, verse 4. My Bible is too small. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. There's something that I want you to notice about this calling from the Lord. It says, Moses, Moses. Bless you. (laughs) 
Moses, Moses. And if you don't know, in a Middle Eastern context, when you say the word, the name of the person two times, it means as an affection. It means that I know you. It means I am intimate with you. So when God is calling Moses with his name, Moses, Moses, the saying that I know you intimately. And that is certainly amazing, is it not? So a little update to what has happened. Last week, we talked about how the Pharaoh is trying to kill all the babies because he's afraid of the people multiplying in large number because God is blessing them. Be fruitful and multiply, and it's actually happening to them. And then Moses is that baby that actually escapes the judgment of Pharaoh, is saved by the daughter of the Pharaoh, and is raised as a daughter of the Pharaoh's adopted son. And for 40 years, he, he was raised in that culture of Egypt as a prince, adopted prince. But what happens is that at the end of 40 years, he goes to see his people. So he knew that he was a Hebrew. We don't have too much detail about how exactly, when he got to know that he was a Hebrew. But he goes, he knows, and he sees that his people are in pain and in suffering. And he sees an Egyptian shoulder just beating one of the Hebrew slaves. And what does he do? He gets angry, maybe righteous anger, but his righteous anger comes out wrong. He looks around, left and right, makes sure nobody's looking, and he kills the Egyptian soldier, taking the matter into his own hands. That's the theme that seems to be happening, is it not? From Genesis, the people taking the matters into their own hand, taking the fruit, right? This keeps happening. And Moses does the same. He thought nobody was looking, right? We have that experience, right? We, we think nobody's looking, but somebody saw. And people know. And the Pharaoh tries to kill him. And he has to run away because he's afraid to die. Right? That's the story of what's going on. Forty years ago, that's what happened at age of 40. And for 40 years, he, there he finds a wife. All right, somehow he finds a wife. And he's going around living for 40 years in the wilderness. As a fugitive. When you're a fugitive, you try to make sure nobody knows your name. Right? You know, there was a moment of my life when I had to go, I had to run away, run around like a fugitive because somebody threatened my life. And I was like, oh, I'm like, okay, I'm going to stay low. It was actually traumatic. Uh, and then I, I once went to Texas to see my friend, Joe. And, you know, I went to his church and all that. And I was like, you know, I was trying to get close with people again, but I was afraid inside. They were like, what's your name? I was like, why do you want to know my name? I was like, I was like I'm not telling you my name. <laughs> but I was like, whoa, whoa, these are Joe's friends, church people. They're probably okay. Wait, but the person that threatened my life was a church person. So I was like, uh, <laughs> I don't know. So I was like, ah. Uh. So I was like just going on like that. But when you're a fugitive, the point is you don't want people to know your name. And when the, somebody comes up and knows your name, you're like, oh, how do you know me? Right? I, I had that experience for like, first five years, like somebody I don't know knows my name, is like, who are you? Who, who sent you? Right? Like afraid for my life. Not, not afraid, afraid. I can still probably defend myself. But anyways, Moses, a fugitive, who he doesn't want anybody to know his name, but there's this bush that is burning, and from that bush calls out Moses, Moses, affectionate. Affectionate call to Moses. The calling to Moses is affectionate. The calling for us to us is also affectionate. I know sometimes we go to Asian churches and it feels like we're in an army. And people go to ABC. And I'm like, yes sir. And you just go, right? Sometimes that's what it feels like. And maybe at times it needs that. But <laughs> the call from God is affectionate. It's an affectionate call. And just to, point, just to let you know, like just because you know somebody's name doesn't mean you're affectionate or close to that person, right? Uh, we especially know these days. But God, God knows. I think that's a really a comfort to us. God knows us individually of our names. God knows what's going on. Even if you're trying to run away from him or trying to run away from people, trying to live in a 
seclusive life matters not. He knows our name, he loves us, and he affectionately calls out. That is awesome. And after Moses, uh, God calls out to Moses affectionately, Moses, Moses, I know you. I intimately know what's going on in your life. Having run from 40 years in the wilderness going around, you're in the 80s and you don't even have your own sheep. You're just a shepherd taking care of another person's. Your father-in-law has sheep. It's like working for your mom's and pop's store until you're age 80. My brother and I did that until we're like 18 and 26. And we were like, we want to be our own men. But <laughs> Moses, because he's a fugitive running around, that's what he's doing. He doesn't want anybody to know, but God knows. And after God calls him affectionately in chapter 3, verse 10, it says, Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. From verse 4 to verse 10, basically what God says is, I know the pain and the suffering of my people. I have heard, I have seen, I am listening, and my heart is breaking for my people. Why is he sharing that to Moses, right? I think the reason why Moses, God shares to Moses of his, I know the suffering of the people, is because he also wants to remind, because Moses cared about the people before, about how they were suffering. But God wants to remind Moses again because he's just traveling around for 40 years, just a wilderness, trying to take care of his own family, right? He's a runaway, stowaway. Just trying to take care of the sheep. He's just trying to do what he can. Maybe he doesn't care about uh, Egypt anymore or his people going on because he's too busy trying to survive on his own. When our own life is in danger, we don't care about other people even if you did before, right? Maybe that's where Moses is at. And God reminds him again that the people, they're still in suffering. What can we take away from there? I think God, He wants us to know. He wants us to know of His concerns, of His compassion for the people, and He wants, to, he wants us to adopt to His priorities. Not just in survival mode. I'm in survival mode for past one year. And sometimes I cannot look around. But I have to keep coming back to God. Lord, Lord, what are your concerns? What are your compassion? What are your priorities that you want me to look at? Right? Let me tell you a story of how this comes out. Uh, there's this, he was a missionary in Russia, his, at least his pen name is L, I don't know if that's his true name, probably, maybe, uh, but L, he once in 1989, he visited Russia, Moscow, and if you know that that's still during the time of Iron Curtain, uh, blistering cold in March, he visited the Red Square, where the communists are in full reign, and he heard a shout, he turned around him. He saw a man on fire. And he looked and he was like, what's going on? And then right after he heard the scream and he saw the man on fire, he see a police car running, uh, just going past him. And he see two soldiers running toward him, shoving him down, putting out the fire, opening the police car and shoving him in the back. And the police car goes away. It all happened within one minute, less than a minute. And he wonders, he had to get over the initial shock. What just happened? Man, on, man screaming, on fire, put out, put in the police car. Not ambulance, police car, and ran away. His first trip to Moscow. What's going on? And then he asked the interpreter next to him after that initial phase of shock. He asked, what did the man scream about? What was he screaming about? And the interpreter answers, the communists have killed my family and I don't want to live anymore. 
Mm. But nobody saw, except for few men. There were no video cameras, and there are, of course, no phone cameras in 1989. Nobody would know. Not a newspaper. Why would it go with newspaper? His friends, other family members would not know, probably would not know what happened to him. And he pondered, what am I supposed to do with this information or what I have with this? And eventually, with time, he realized that that is the cry of the Russian people. Cry that maybe no one in the world might hear, but it's a cry that he has heard that God is hearing. The cry of the Russian people. And that's how he decided to be a missionary to Russia back in the communist days, smuggling the Bible in so that people can receive the word of God because he realized that he has heard and he has seen the suffering of the people that God cares about. So what can I do? Right? Did you know that God uses people? That God calls on the people and he affectionately calls us? Whether it be Tammy, Tammy, or Chloe, or I don't know. <laughs> he knows us affectionately and he, he calls us and he wants us to see. He wants us to hear. He wants us to recognize the suffering and the cries of the people to take that perspective that eyes that only focuses on ourselves because we're in a survival mode and he wants us to open up our heart, open up our eyes, open up our ears to see the suffering of his people. And his affectionate call to us. You know, just talking about the technical difficulties. You know, last week I had a technical revelation, right? Um, I don't know if you guys know there's an Elgato Stream Deck. If you're not a streamer, you probably don't know, but it's a bunch of LCD keys uh, where they're 16 one, they're 9, 6, whatever. Uh, so you press a button and you can make it do stuff, right? And then, you know, in the morning, usually on Sunday morning is a battle for time. One minute is precious, at least to me. And when I, we're trying to set up the media, we have to open up the browser. We have to at least open up five browsers of Spotify, Gmail, and uh, the church website, and the YouTube pages. So when I'm, when I'm typing all that, and it takes at least three to five minutes to do that. It takes so much time. But I realized we had the stream deck just sitting there. I was like, hmm, wow, what does this do? And like, Figured out you can just press five buttons and in less than a second, like in 0.7 seconds, I can just get everything up there. Save me four minutes. Wow. And you know what else I realized last week? Last week I was typing it. I realized that I can program all the five functions into one key. So I just press a button. 0.1 second. Five minutes condensed into 0.1 seconds. That's Bay Area dream. Efficiency. Right? Why am I telling you this story? Because we have first world problems and first world revelations. Five minutes. Me, I'm being excited over saving 0.6 seconds. The suffering. Mm. Did you know that we are so blessed? And I don't... This time I don't mean spiritually. I mean materialistically. We are so blessed. Most of us probably have food to eat every meal. I certainly do. Right? Most of us have roof over our heads. Most of us have some sort of AC or heating system. We don't have to wear clothes or take off clothes in order to survive or live. 
Most of us have parents. Most of us have electricity with clean water. We don't have to go purify or filter it. We are blessed beyond imagination. And Paul Washer, one of the missionaries that I love to listen to, one of the first missionary pastors that just lit up the soul inside of me with the Word of God, he says that we will be held accountable to the blessings that we have received. We are blessed beyond imagination materialistically of course we start comparing to the people around us and maybe we don't feel as blessed that person driving Rivian I'm driving a Honda Honda is pretty good actually I'm driving a Toyota Toyota is pretty good too I don't know right We are blessed beyond imagination in terms of education. The education that we receive. Yeah, we compare to the other people that may be above us. That you, you have three PhD and two postdoc? Okay. First world problems. First world revelations. But God wants us to shift our focus to the cries and the suffering of his people and affectionately calls us. I'm going to send you where you go. But you know, we feel unqualified. I just work at in and out I love in and out I learned so much more about Life at in and out than working else places. I learned how to work efficiently. I learned how to work with people. I learned, man. But we feel like I'm not qualified. I'm not prepared right. Why do we think like that? Because we're looking at other people amongst ourselves. Because that's not how God prepares. God is not preparing on your talent. God is not preparing on your skill set. To a certain degree, yes, but that's not exactly what he's looking for, right? Second point. God prepares you for the call. Maybe in a different way that you have thought. God prepares you. In Genesis, uh, Genesis, Exodus chapter 3, verse 11, it says, But Moses said to God, Who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. Look at the way he phrases the question. And of course it's understandable. He has been traveling and being a fugitive for 40 years. His wandering wilderness with sheep. I mean, we know, we've gone through COVID. If you didn't have family with you back then like me, I was with two cats. Cats are wonderful companions, but they're not much to talk to. They don't really respond. Moses, he's talking to himself probably most of the time. And he was in the elite of the elite. He knew the education. He knew the Pharaoh's court, what was going on there. He knew what he had to do to have a hearing with the Pharaoh. He knew what had to be done. And now he's just a lowly shepherd. He's not even an adopted prince. What can I do? Pharaoh used to want me dead. But think about this. If it was 40 years ago, when Moses was the prince, doing well in life, strong and mighty, just can kill a soldier, guess how he would have responded? He probably would have responded, Finally, God, my time has come to shine. I am not just in the court of the Pharaoh for no reason. There's a reason for why I'm here. There's a reason for why I know the language as a Hebrew. I know the culture. I know the tactics of the armies. There's a reason why I'm the Pharaoh's daughter. 
Pharaoh's son, daughter's son. Oh. There's a reason. I know I'm Hebrew. All right, I got skill sets. Let me see what I can do. I have the plan. All right, God, you called me at the perfect time. But 40 years went by. He hasn't spoken the language for 40 years, probably. Rusty in language. He doesn't know what's going on in Egypt. He's out of touch with the latest political topography. Is that even the right way of ex- I don't want to say that. He doesn't know what's going on. His last update is probably 40 years ago. Maybe here and there. Maybe he hears, but he probably doesn't want to hear because he's afraid of people who know information of Egypt because he's a fugitive. But you know what? Even though he felt unqualified, it was actually the perfect time for God to call him. Why? Because Moses, God was getting rid of Moses' hubris, his pride, his dependency on his self, on his strength, on his skill set. He's stripping that away in the wilderness for 40 years. He had maybe righteous anger, but it came out wrong with the wrongful action and killed a man. He was willing to kill a man for the sake of justice. But now, he was just a lowly shepherd, 80 years old, cannot do that with his own strength. And it was perfect time for God to call him because it is now that God can use him and Moses can depend on God. You know, sometimes we feel like our time spent doing, I don't know, working at a lowly job or being an intern for a long time or mm, we feel like it's a waste of time. Waste of time. Working at Starbucks. I love Starbucks. I worked at Starbucks too. Working at in and out Waste of my time. Getting another degree. What's the point? We cannot do anything with it anyway. Waste of time, it feels like. But weird example. 14 years ago, I was at Barton Noble. And I think I was reading a magazine. Somehow this information is in my head. I think it's, I got that from Barton Noble in a magazine. Apparently, there was an English rock band called Beatles. Have you guys heard? Beatles? They're, popular. They're the most influential and most popular band in London and in the world. But you know how they started? In the beginning, they had no gigs, so they had to go around in the pubs. They had to go around in the places where nobody was really cared about them. They were just drunk and barely listening to them, almost with no crowd. They're going to no plain places, and they were performing in there. But one of the members after their success have said that it is those humble beginning that has taught them how to play in a live stage with imperfect, imperfect situations. It is exactly at those times that we have honed our skill sets. And of course, the difference between Moses and the Beatles is that the Beatles are trying to make go big and go onto the big stage, and Moses is trying to stay away from the bigger stage, right? But I think that applies here because God was preparing Moses perfectly. Because God, because Moses, he was, a, he was a shepherd to who? The father's in law's flock, not even his own sheep, but he was, he was just doing it, taking them around the wilderness. And what is Moses about to do? He was going to take the flock of God, not his own, the flock of God, the Father, the Heavenly Father in heaven, and he was going to lead them into the wilderness. God was preparing Moses perfectly in the time that Moses might have thought is a waste of time. Isn't that amazing how God works to prepare us? Sometimes it's not the best route we think in order to become the elite. God prepares us for the call that we have. 
God had Moses right where he wanted him. I believe that for us too. I believe he is preparing us. He's trying to strip away the hubris that we have of self-dependency and sufficiency. He wants to take that away from us. Not forcefully. But put us in a situation that we can, we can become shaped by Him. So that we can be used by Him. And in order to further point that out, Moses asks, Who am I? That's the question. And God is going to answer with two things. In Exodus chapter 3 verse 12, it says that he said, But I will be with you, and this shall be signed for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. God answers with two things, that I will be with you, and there will be fulfillment of signs that you have been called by me. But, I don't know if you guys, so we're going to focus on the I'll be with you, but did you guys notice something about God here? Because God asks, oh no, Moses asks, who am I to go? And what does God say? God doesn't even answer the question. He doesn't talk about who you are, how you're qualified, Moses. You know, I was a children ministry pastor before, like six, seven years ago. Yes, I think that's the thing, correct. And, you know, it was so much fun working with the children and, you know, sometimes just messing with them in a healthy way. And there was an eight-year-old. Uh, she asked me, like, what are your favorite hobbies? And things like that, just wanted to get to know me. And, like, she was just asking me questions. And I was like, well, there are many things that I like to do in my life, and A, B, and C. And I was just rambling on for five minutes. And then after, she was like, Mommy. He didn't answer any of my questions. I was, like, I was like, oh, you're right. By the way, she's graduating middle school, and I'm going to her party. I was like, so it's, like, time travels so fast, right? But anyways, like, God sometimes doesn't answer the question. And they're like, you're like, if you think about it, if you're a brain power of an eight-year-old, you're like, that, he's not really answering the questions. Like, what's going on, right? Why is God saying, who am I to go? And why does God say, well, I'm going to be with you? What's going on there? I think if we kind of put our thoughts to it, basically what Moses is saying is, how am I qualified to go? How am I qualified? Why am I going? There must be other pre person that's better. But what is God's answer is saying, I'm going to be with you. What is God saying there? He's indirectly saying that, Moses, you're depending on your identification of who you are and what you can do, and you did that 40 years before, and right now you still have that residue of how you think about self-sufficiency and how you are qualified. Well, sorry for cliche, it's not about you. I'm with you. Identify with me. It's not your language skill. It's not your skill set. It's not how much you know how to navigate different cultures. I am with you. I am. I'll be with you. I am the difference maker. I am the game changer. Identify yourself with me. I am with you. I will carry you. I got you. That's what God is saying. I am with you. And Anybody watching MSI, League of Legends? Am I the only one? Oh, yeah. Oof. Both Korean team made it. Game 5. You guys have no idea what I'm talking about. But there's a, a team called T1. So this is just an example for you. <laughs> That's called T1, right? And there's a guy, Faker. He's a living legend. Everybody knows him. Even if you don't know League of Legends, everybody knows Faker. You should know Faker. If you don't know, it's, it's like close to sin. Like... You, you, <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry. That's, that's not right. Uh, but Faker, he's famous. He's a living legend. He won like four worlds. Um, but his new team right now, every one of them are new. And last year, three of them were rookies, I believe. Or was it two years ago? But like there was a game. So because there were rookies in a team that's like, they're like Yankees or 49ers, sure. Uh, <laughs> they're prestigious. 
Everybody wants to be in that team. But these are three rookies. All the fans want the championship. Only championship. The world. Only win. But with that pressure and being a rookie, what happens? No courage. There was a situation they had to make a call. It's a team game. And like, it's like, can we finish this? I don't know. What, what should we do? They're being wishy washy. Because what happens? You make a one mistake and something goes wrong, they get substituted out for somebody else. Because they're a rookie, they're not proven. And Faker, the living legend, is like, just go, just go, 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 go. I got you. I'll take the responsibility. Just go, just go. And they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. No, just go, 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 go. And everybody go, and they win. That's what God is saying. God is fake. No. <laughs> But much higher than that. Right? He's saying, I am with you. I am going to carry you. Literally, I got you. Do not depend on your qualification, but depend on me. You're 80 years old. You cannot kill people with your strength anymore. Depend on me. Not your talents. Identify with me. And did you know that God has also the same call for us? Oh, whoa, whoa, wait. Does that mean we have to go into a country and deliver people like Moses and bring people out and go into the wilderness? Kind of. Because I, I think we all know this. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 through 22, uh, to 20. Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. What is, the, what is Jesus saying to his disciples here? He's saying, Go make disciples. Go share the gospel. Go teach them to obey my commands. Go to the people who are lost. Go to the people who are suffering. Share the gospel. Make disciples. Teach them to obey. Baptize them. This calling is only for Moses Absolutely not. It's also calling for all Christians who believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, our Lord and Savior. And if He has died on the cross for our sins, then He commands us to go. And with the power of the resurrection that we have witnessed, with that, He also commands us to go. And the same promise. I will be with you. I am going to carry you. It's not about your qualification, how cultured, how experienced, how skilled you are, what kind of status you have. Sometimes we say, wait, 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 God. I'm not, I don't have high status yet. Let me just wait until I have the high status, until I have something going on in my life. Then I can go, no, God is saying, I got you where, you, where I want you. Go. It's not your authority. It's by my authority that I am sending you. Go, make disciples. And I say this out of encouragement because after coming to faith in Christ, I struggled with this concept of making disciples for almost 10 years. Who am I to go? Who am I to make disciples? I don't even know the Bible. I just, I just believed. Are you kidding me? People are asking me questions. I don't know. I have no idea what they're asking. Is that even Bible scripture? I don't know, God. But it's a matter of obedience, not a matter of success. God tells us to go. God doesn't say to go, go, go convert 100 people. He says to obey. It's not about the number of people. that you effectively disciple and change their life. It's about obedience. Right? That, that is the Bible, what the scripture says, that Jesus says, right? We also have the call. And under the aspect of the call, sometimes we forget when we, because we are a church that really on fire and passion for the word of God, and we want to go make disciples, and like, you know, man, 
Sometimes we forget another aspect. Teaching them to obey as you are obeying. Like we sometimes forget that aspect. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1 through 3, it says, Ephesians chapter 4, 1 through 3, I therefore, prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So in Ephesians chapter 1 to 3, Paul is laying out for us the, the gospel of our Jesus Christ and how we, are identify, we can identify in Jesus Christ that we are born again in Christ alone by His grace. And then he says in chapter 4, he starts with, well, we have a calling as a Christ Christian, as we identify with Christ now, we have a calling with this new identity in Christ, which has been given to us by grace, updated, whatever you want to say. With that life comes a calling. With that life, with that new identity comes a life that we should live that is worthy of the calling. What does that Worthiness look like? Humility. Gentleness. And gentleness does not mean weakness. It's not implying weakness at all. It is implying self-controlled and tempered spirit. I'm so sorry, Lord. It says patience. It says, bearing with one another in love. Bearing, being patient, being gentle, in humility. That's how our life as a Christian who identify in Christ looks like. That's what we are supposed to go and teach and disciple. This also says, bearing with one another. I cannot be a Christian and just be by myself. Because when I'm a people, oh, I become unchristianized. Well, this certainly has... The calling that we have received does not call us to a private relationship with God. It does to a certain point, but it also calls us to a life in community with other believers. That's why we have to bear with one another. Because we're all sinners. Because we're all imperfect. Because we're all work in progress. We're his masterpiece, but we're being sanctified. And that means we make mistakes and we hurt people. But Christ followers, those who identify in Christ, bear with one another. It means putting our pride down, our arrogance away. We're called to a community. We have this calling. If you, by grace of God, follow and put your salvation, put your faith in the work of Jesus Christ and believe that you are children of God adopted into the wonderful family, having changed the the status as an enemy of God to child of God. If you know that joy, that progression, that, that, that step, if you understand that faith, then this is a challenge for us all. We have a calling. We have a calling to make disciples and to teach them to obey. And teaching them to obey, we also have to obey Jesus Christ in humility and gentleness and self-control, with patience, bearing with one another, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit that has given in our heart in the bond of 
peace. This is a calling for us all, not just for few of the selected in the community. Uh, I would, if the praise team can come up and minister to us. Uh, so we do not have the screen working. So at this time, I want us to enter into time of prayer. And as we enter into time of prayer, let's struggle with, those, with that question. God is calling us. What are we responding to that call with? Are we responding like Moses, saying that, who am I to go? Or maybe we have different uh, response to that call. But do realize that as we go to God and just, pr- just praying and just considering of the call that He has given us, He's affectionately calling us. not calling us the communist commander, general commander, forcing us to go, but he's affectionately calling us. Let us enter in the time of prayer.
on the trauma or baggages that we have regarding pets associated with it. And respond to the affectionate call that Jesus Christ is giving to us as he has called out to Paul. Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Let's enter into time of prayer. Whichever it might be, there's something for us to repent of. So let us commit that we will, by the Spirit of God, by the power of the Spirit, that we will do all we can to be His witness and walk our life that is worthy. So let's pray that prayer of commitment. I'll end this in prayer.
so thankful that you have given us the word of God that you just you, you choose to communicate with us, you choose to save us, you choose to send your you chose to send your own one and only son because you loved us. And Lord, you also call, you call us. Would you please continue to prepare our lives for the calling that you are giving us, Lord? And would you please help us recognize that we haven't been prepared by your glory, for your glory. Would you please give us strength to be patient and be humble and to go and make disciples and to see the suffering of the world, not just be stuck with perspective just around. Lord, would you please plant, plant in our hearts that can learn to see and feel and to grow and to be passionate and to be loving to other people, Lord. And would you please give us the strength to work on them. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this special day. We get to celebrate your, uh, the mother that you have given us in our church, in our families. Let us cherish them. Let us thank them. And if some of us have that pain of not knowing our mothers, Lord, give us that heart of mercy. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all.